It's just a delight to be here, you guys. Um, when we first went, came to UMD, Sally and I, um, in 1994, um, we were raising support, and I called Thor, who I knew from the river, um, and I said, hey, will you guys support us? And he said, yes, I think over the phone. <laughs> and uh, so this church has supported us for 21 years, every month, generously. Um, you're one of our biggest givers. So I just, from from, uh, from Sally and I, and really the whole team now that, that is there, uh, there's, a, there's about five people on staff there. So, you know, we say thanks to you guys for your generous support and for, uh, you know, being there when, <laughs> when we didn't have anything. So uh, it's really a blessing. Um, Sally is down at our, our SALT conference is the uh, big annual student conference that Chi Alpha has. It's down in Minneapolis, or our region is in Minneapolis. So she's down there. I drove up last night so I could be here with you guys. And so she would love to be here, but she's manning the table down there at, at SALT. There's almost 900 students down there. Um, and just, uh, I was thinking when, when you were introducing me, Mary Kay, uh, I met a girl down there. Her name's Bethany. She's like 19. And her dad, I, I, um, I was an intern at the U of M, whatever, long, long ago. And uh, his name was Paul. He co-led a group with me. And now his daughter is in Chi Alpha, and she wants to do the Chi Alpha internship and in going to ministry. So, um, you know, it's just to see the faithfulness of God over generations is something amazing, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, we've, we've been uh, ministering at UMD uh, and leading the team there. And over the last year, a couple of years, we really felt that uh, our time there was coming to a close. So um, we, uh, we have a great team. And back in May, we completely handed over the ministry to these younger guys. Um, the, two, the two men, uh, Dan and Grant and their wives, the two guys got saved at UMD and now are leading the ministry. So um, it's cool to see them and Students are getting saved up there um, in the fall. Almost every week, students were coming to Christ. So really exciting to see them continue and, uh, and, and go hard for God. So, um, and in the meantime, uh, Sally and I have been involved, and actually our whole team, with ministry in Scandinavia for about 12 years, uh, mostly in Norway, but been to Norway many times, um, and uh, helped to start a uh, campus ministry in Trondheim, Norway, and had a team that lived there for five years and planted a, a ministry. So, um, but in the in the last, uh, back in March, we were coming back from Europe and from doing outreach in, in Denmark, and we thought we were going to kind of dial it down now. We're in our early 60s, my wife and I, and um, we're sitting in a coffee shop, a Starbucks in the Copenhagen airport, and you know that still small voice started speaking to us that we weren't done in Europe. And um, we started to uh, knock on the doors and the, the lights turned green. And so we got, we were invited by uh, some of got missionaries to come uh, and live in Denmark um, and help them uh, to uh, resource and develop campus ministry in Scandinavia. So um, that'll be mostly in Denmark and Southern Sweden and, uh, and also in Norway. So um, at, at this late age, or whatever you want to call it, uh, we, we've got a new assignment from the Lord to, to go to Europe. We'll be there eight and a half months a year as, as long as he gives us health and strength to work. So I want to show you a few pictures. Um, of. Uh, so uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, and... Um, Next slide, please. So this was us. Sometimes I have to remember we were young once. And so there's our daughters. <laughs> Emily and Rebecca, they're 25 and 27 right now. They're actually down at the SALT conference, so they've been staying with us uh, before we head out. We leave on Wednesday for Denmark. So And, and hey, when, when, we, when God first started speaking to us about this, just to decide if we were really insane or it was really God, we first went to our daughters, you know, they're, they're our most trusted confidants, and they were like, you should go for it, yeah, this would be awesome. So, um, so there's them a long time ago. Next slide. Um, here is Ivar. He's a real Norwegian that led the student group in Trondheim 
Norway. Um, next slide. This is our team uh, that's now leading Chi Alpha. Dan and Sarah De La Forest and Grant and Danielle Houle on the right there. And then, um, yeah, and I think Kaylin's there. Kaylin and Matt Zimmer. Kaylin did uh, intern with us for a couple of years, and now she's she and Matt. I know you guys uh, love them and know them well. They're they're planting. You know all this, I'm sure, but they're planting Chi Alpha over at UWS and Superior. So really proud of them. Kaylin's down at the Salt Conference too. Um, then in the middle, in the back, Jeff and Catherine Winkleman spent a couple years uh, on staff with us here at UMD, and they're planting a Chi Alpha uh, in Milwaukee, at the University of Milwaukee. Um, so um, they're leaving us. Michelle, next to them in the back, is an intern with us. Um, so, and then our daughters are there too. But I guess the point is that um, we want to send. We want to train people and equip them, and we want to send them out and then see them do the same thing, you know, that we did. So uh, that's what Jesus does. He reproduces life in willing hearts, and he calls, and he sends, and he brings fruit. And every single one of us, right, we're, we're called in such a profound way to reach our friends and our families and, and just to be ambassadors for the love of God to everybody we see. So, yeah, next slide, please. So we're going to Copenhagen. And there are two cities, just a 30-minute train ride apart, uh, Malmö in southern Sweden and Copenhagen, Denmark. Next slide. There's an incredible bridge that connects them. Um, right now, uh, because of the massive influx of refugees in Europe um, and because of the, you know, Europe is just in a, in a state of such uh, turmoil right now, for the first time in a long time, before you cross this bridge, you have to have your documents checked uh, because of the, the Europeans are, are trying to uh, just get a handle on all the, the refugees that are streaming in, through the streets of Europe, more, more uh, refugees than any time since World War II. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say Europe is in a state of flux that they have not been in for 60 years. Um, next slide. There's 300,000 unreached university students in the greater metro area. There's pastors there tell us about 1% of these kids have a saving relationship with Jesus. So just a massive student population, and almost none of them know Jesus. And there's, there are so few Christians uh, in Denmark and Sweden that there's almost no one to witness to them. Next slide. So how do we reach them? These are some old friends from Chi Alpha. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, when we started at UMD, the only thing we really need to do, knew to do was to begin to pray. Um, and we wanted to see a place where the Holy Spirit could come, where Jesus could be made known to, to students. And, I mean, honestly, I, I feel like uh, we, we didn't know anything, but we knew um, that Jesus was faithful. And if we put him in the center, you know, when we prayed with the team, Mac prayed something along the lines of, you know, if we keep the focus on Jesus, we're going to be okay here, you know. And I just thought that that's been our really philosophy of ministry from the very beginning, um, was just to try to keep Jesus in the center of everything, and then and he would save and heal and deliver, and yeah. So um, next slide. We had a prayer meeting in our living room for 15 years on Wednesday nights, and that was probably our favorite time in, in ministry. We also uh, are recruiting teams to come. We believe strongly that uh, teams are, the, are an effective way uh, to plant new works. So we're recruiting teams. We, uh, and next slide. And then we're filling them full of Norwegian coffee, and they get a lot more active after we do that. So <laughs> next slide. Um, this is uh, an outreach we were part of a couple of months ago in Copenhagen. This is a team from Portland. Uh, Paul and Sonia Gibbs planted a university church. They interned with us years ago. And I know they're dear friends of, of, uh, of Mac and Jen here, too. They went to North Central. So they brought a team of musicians and, uh, and people that wanted to make friends uh, for Jesus. They came to Copenhagen. And we were part of a big outreach call, called Welcome to Copenhagen, where churches, 25 churches and ministries that wanted to reach students. And I'm talking from state church. Lutheran to Catholics to Pentecostals and Baptists all working together 
And they told us that this was unprecedented in the recent church history uh, uh, of Denmark, that all these different uh, groups could come together for one purpose, which was to share Christ with the 60,000 incoming freshmen that were coming to the universities of Copenhagen. So we spent a week reaching out to these kids. Uh, next slide. And here's, here's the uh, team uh, in Copenhagen. So over the last couple of years, we recruited a team that has now moved to, I, I'm sorry, Malmö in southern Sweden. Right now, the southern cone of Sweden, Malmö's at the tip, the southern tip of Sweden, is about 30% Muslim. Uh, so um, there's a lot of Muslims living there um, and a lot of students. And so these guys are five Europeans. They just moved there a month ago, and we're going to be helping to oversee this team to plant a university ministry in Malmö. Uh, and then we'll be recruiting another team uh, to work with us in Denmark. So next slide. Um, and we, we believe in an evangelistic community and, and um, uh, of sharing our, our faith, and making friends for Jesus. So we'll be doing anything we can to meet, um, you know, radically secular uh, students um, in, in Scandinavia and somehow find a way to share the love of Christ with them. So here was a massive outreach in a park. Next slide. Um, they gave, you know, just gave away free food, just found ways to talk to, uh, to students. Next slide. There's, uh, there's literally like 10 million bicycles in Copenhagen. When you walk on the streets, Copenhagen's got 2 million people in it, and everyone has like three bikes. So I think Sally and I are going to get bikes. Um, but I can tell you, you know, when you walk on the sidewalk, there's a bike lane, and then there's the vehicle lane. And so I'm used to looking out for trucks, you know. Um, but you could get wasted in five seconds by a bicycle. And, uh, you know, I had to learn to worry about that bicycle lane more, more than the truck. So they are going like 30 miles an hour, and they don't stop. Uh, next slide. Um, I will make you fishers of men here with uh, Kelly, the second from the left. She was on our original team to Trondheim. She lived there for five years, and she married a Norwegian boy named Mats there, who's a, a, an engineer. They lived down in Bergen. And she led just a, an incredible little student ministry in Trondheim uh, and saw a lot of fruit there. So we were going, they took us fishing out in the fjord. And uh, anyway, so next slide. Here are two Danes, a Swede, and a Finn at the prayer conference we have every summer. Um, and the only question is, next slide, where are the Norwegians? So we don't want to lose sight of those Norwegians. My grandfather came across in a boat in 1899. Um, so yeah, we're passionate about, we're living in Denmark, but we want to, uh, we really want to visit regularly in, up in Norway and, um, and encourage uh, churches to reach out to students. So next slide. So one of the things, uh, there's, a, there's a prayer conference in the summer there and students from all over Europe come. It's about 100 of them. Um, to give you a comparison, our SALT in Minneapolis is almost 900 students. We were, at the SALT, we were at the SALT conference, student conference in Dallas a couple of weeks ago, and there were 2,000 uh, students worshiping together, and I can tell you that was an awesome experience and just passionate for missions. Um, really a heart to, to give a year or more and go to another culture and share their faith. So, But there's this, there's this, there's this little precious group of students that meet um, it'll be in Brussels next summer, and they have, a, they have one night where they pray. All they do is spend a night praying for their countries and their universities and their friends. And then some of them, uh, you know, write, do an artwork or, or write what's on their heart. And this one was for France. May France remember the fourth word of the revolution's motto, justice, and return to the one who has made a way. Come, Lord. So I know we all can remember the images just a few weeks ago of 150 or so uh, French people in Paris that were, were gunned down uh, by violent uh, terrorists. Um, and then the next slide, um, Syria. There's a million Syrian refugees in Europe right now, and, um, and they're overwhelming these societies. And I met, a, I met a Christian man from Syria at this conference last summer. He was, he was a Orthodox Christian from Syria, really loved Jesus, was an incredible person. And this was his um, work, Pray for Hope and Peace. And I thought that those two uh, images 
of the Syrian refugees and all the Middle Eastern refugees. Uh, and then, on the other hand, just the radical, secular, post-Christian Europeans that have no, um, no concept of God, no idea that are, are alone and without God in the world. So it's a, it's a crossroads time for Europe. And uh, I just want to say, you know, I, I know in Europe and, and the same in our country, there's a, there's a lot of tension uh, over uh, terrorism. There's a lot of tension over the immigration issue. And I, I'm not a politician, um, and I trust that our, our governments will do what they need to to keep us safe. And I also know that it's easy for us to give in to fear. Um, and and I, I know that every Muslim person is is made in the image of God, has a soul made in the image of God, just waiting for Jesus Christ to enter in there where he belongs and that he, he loves the Muslim people. And so let's, let's keep that. When we have a chance to build uh, a bridge of friendship to a Muslim person, and, and most of us don't, don't even, even know any Muslims, but um, let's take that and let's really share the love of God with them because... Um, for years, I've seen this as, as just these two, these two kind of strongholds of radical secularism and then Muslim incursion, which the goal of which is to take over Europe, you know, uh, Eurabia, some people call it, you know, so, but, and I was just vexed by this, like, how can we, uh, you know, it was just, it was so huge, how can we make any progress, and I've been, you know, in Norway enough, I've spent almost a year in Norway over a 10-year period where just to have a conversation with somebody about faith is a big deal. You know, you have to win somebody's trust. You have to have a relationship. It takes time. It's, it's, it's uh, incredibly time intensive to see a European person come to Jesus. And then, uh, but this last time we were there, um, I was sitting in the, the, the office of this of a Danish guy named Hans Heinrich Lund. And he, he helped us to get our missionary visas, which we got in two weeks, we, we got our paperwork done before we left Denmark. That was unprecedented. You never could have done that a few years ago. Um, and Hans Heinrich told Sally and I, he said, you know, um, there's an opportunity here to, for Muslims to be reached in, in Europe that's unprecedented. He said, I just came from a camp, a refugee camp of 224 Syrians, and we preached the gospel. And in, in Denmark, they are allowed by law to, to preach the gospel in the refugee camps. And he said every single one of those Syrians said they wanted to have a relationship with Jesus. Now, we, we don't know what's in their hearts, but um, there, there is uh, the greatest opportunity, I think, in, in, in any recent memory to reach Muslims in Europe. So please pray for us and pray that there'll be a massive ingathering of, of Muslim people to Jesus in Europe. And that, that, that's, what, that's what he wants to happen. So, um, yeah, next slide. This is the hard cry of every European uh, Christian student, I think, is that, that secular culture is looming over them, but in their heart somewhere, there's a little voice that says, God is not dead. <laughs> they might be the only one in their, in their chemistry auditorium of 300 that knows Jesus, but there's a little light inside of them, right? There's a, there's a little light burning, and in that darkness, it burns really, really bright. And some of these, some of these Scandinavian kids I know that have come to Jesus uh, are some of the most awesome Christians you, you're ever going to meet, so... Next slide. Scandinavia is waiting for the gospel. So, uh, yeah, it's a land of opportunity right now. So I want to just share, just for a minute, um, uh, from the word. I'm almost out of time. But, um, yeah, if you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 3 uh, or your electronic devices. I, I, there's some people here I know that still use Bibles, but where I preach most of the time, <laughs> everyone's looking at their phones <laughs> at this point, so... Um, yeah, Acts chapter 3, uh, 1 through 10. I'll read it. This is uh, John and Peter. After the resurrection, they, they've been to the gates of hell and watched Jesus die brutally on a cross and then waited in despair. And three days later, they saw the fruit of God's plan to reconcile the, the world to himself. Amen. So, now Peter and John went up to, to get, uh, together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, 
look at us. So he gave, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him up by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew what it was. They knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So Peter and uh, John had a routine, and most, uh, most committed Jews would do this. They went twice to the temple to pray during the day, once at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning and once at 3 in the afternoon. And um, we have routines in our lives, and I, I, we need them. They're good. But if our routines kind of end up ruling our lives, and so that if anything breaks into my routine, I'm like, well, I can't really deal with that right now. Because I think God wants us to be open in the middle of our structured lives for opportunities when he wants to break in, right, to our routine. So they're walking up there like they did every single day, only, only this day was different. And um, something very extraordinary happened. It said a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was laying at the gate of the temple where he'd been brought every day, maybe his whole life. And so this guy was, uh, had a big problem. And it was nothing, it wasn't his fault. You know, he was lame from birth. And I think sometimes we look at one another and we say, hey, you know, get it together or you shouldn't do that or we should be better at this. But we're, we're a sinful race. You know, we've inherited uh, sinful tendencies. Uh, we've inherited physical stuff. And, um, and, and we're, we're kind of like that guy laying at this temple gate, right? And discouraged. You know, uh, if you've walked with God or if you've been alive on this planet, very long, you're going to go through times of discouragement, right? There's times where dreams seem so far away. Even promises that God maybe has made to you uh, feels like, hey, what's, what's going on? I, I don't see the answers to my prayers. I, I don't see um, what I need, you know, to have uh, a decent life. But this guy was sitting there. Uh, he was discouraged, and, and, it, and it really the, he couldn't get his eyes any higher then maybe if I can get enough money for bread for this day, you know, uh, that's good enough. He's, he's, settled, he's settled for that. Um, but, you know, this, this gate was called beautiful. And uh, interesting, isn't it, that the place they laid this guy uh, was called beautiful. And, uh, and the place of our suffering, every single one of us go through this. We go through times of suffering, of despair and discouragement. And we think that this is the worst place I could ever be, and it means that the promises aren't going to happen in my life, and it means that I'm never going to be what I had hoped to be. Um, and yet, Jesus has written over the gates of our lives, beautiful, you know, and the places of suffering in our lives, and I found this to be true, have been the, the deepest works of God in my life. Where, where, when I was in that place, and either the times I've had... Uh, you know, physical illness and different things that I've dealt with that at the time I, I felt so despairing. And yet, and I didn't even know that behind me on the wall was written beautiful and that, um, and that Jesus had something more and that he was going to use the suffering in our lives and in this guy's life to make something beautiful for God. Um, so these guys um, say, well, I don't have any money, um, but I have one thing. That's what you're going to like a lot, and that's Jesus. And he prayed for him, and so this dude is healed. And, you know, if, if we will look for the opportunities in our lives, we'll be able to see physical healing in, in our friends and neighbors. Um, and just be a little, a little bold to say, hey, can I pray for you? And I've, very few times in my life when I ask somebody that, in an in a appropriate context, has anybody ever said no? Um, so uh, they say, yeah. And, and, and I think... I'm always looking at what I don't have. You know, silver or gold, I don't have much of that. I, I feel like a lot of resources I don't have a lot of. But Peter didn't care about that. He was looking at what he did have. And what he had was something that can benefit everybody, and that was, that was the, the life of Jesus in him and the power of Jesus to heal. So he's, what I have, I give to you. You know, it reminds me, there, there was a Norwegian pastor 
in 1906 named T.B., Thomas Ball Barrett. And um, he's a saint in Norway. And uh, so this, this guy had, a, had an English mother and a Norwegian dad. He, he, was, he, he lived in Oslo, and he had an orphanage for kids. He was a, he was a Methodist preacher. So he went to the United States and, uh, to get money. So it was 1906, 1906, that was the year of the Azusa Street Revival. And um, he was could, everywhere he went, he couldn't get any money. No one had money for him. But he ended up in revival meetings in Chicago. And A.B. Simpson, who had come from Azusa Street, was preaching to tens, you know, thousands of people in meetings. And the, there was a there was an unbelievable outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So T.B. Barat got under the fountain. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he came back uh, after a week in these meetings. He went back to Oslo and he started preaching. And that was the start of the Pentecostal movement in Europe. And he, 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 get, he got up and he proclaimed. He said, I went to America looking for money, and I didn't find any of that, but I found something a lot better, and that was the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and some, some people now uh, call him the apostle of, of Europe. And he planted ministries around in Sweden, the Philadelphia churches of, of Norway and Sweden, which, uh, which we're really connected to in a way. Uh, were started by him. So um, it's, it, you know, we have the greatest resource there is um, in our hearts and in our lives and in this precious word. Uh, and and um, God will give us opportunities to share that, and he will heal our lives. You know, I want to just read one more thing. Um, in Luke, I, I don't even have to go there. In, in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, there's a story of Mary um, when Gabriel comes to her and says, oh, by the way, you know, you're going you're gonna to bear the Son of God in your womb. And, so, you know, I was reading this the other day, and I was just amazed at how. So she says, um, well, how can this happen? You know, because I've never known a man. So he, then he says, well, the Holy Spirit's going to, you know, the explanation is the Holy Spirit will come upon you uh, and that holy thing in you. And he said, he'll be the he will uh, rule on the throne of David forever and ever, and he'll be the son of God. So that's the explanation. <laughs> you know, it's like, what? <laughs> and um, she says, okay. And, uh, yeah, you know, let it happen. And then at, at the end, the angel says, for, then he says, hey, just so I'll help you with this. You, your cousin Elizabeth, she's barren, but she's pregnant right now, right? Yeah, and Mary, you know, I'm, I never noticed this, but he gave her this, you know, I felt like God knows our unbelief is so huge. And Mary... Mary's faith was great, but um, it's, it's like, hey, you got a cousin. She's pregnant now. How, how'd that happen? You know, it's like, hey, and then he says this, with God, nothing is impossible. So wherever you're at right now, um, whatever's going on in your life, whatever promises you have that you're holding on to, maybe you're in a place of tremendous victory, or maybe you're waiting, or, or maybe you're in a place of really hardship, but um, God wants to say, Nothing's impossible with me. So the worship team's going to come, um, and I just want to pray for you, um, and and again say thank you. Um, so so let's um, and and um, you know when you think about it, pray for Europe, because millions of Europeans live every day alone, without hope and without God in the world. And and of all the things that can go in the universe of what is possible for them. Um, that Jesus rose from the dead is not one of those things. And they live from birth to death, you know, controlled by powers and principalities that hate them and want to destroy their lives, and there's no awareness of that at all. And they think that every person they've ever known or loved is going to be torn from them ruthlessly at the end of their lives and will never see them again, and they're going to oblivion. And there's a loving God who loved and created every single one of them, and he wants them to know um, that he's there for them. So, Lord... I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the commitment.